Hello, church. How are you guys doing today? <laughs> Do me a favor. Give somebody a high five and say it's a good thing you came to church because you really need it. Come on. How many of y'all sitting next to somebody? you like, God, thank God they're here. They're going to they need this. Yeah. It's all right. Don't raise your hands. Don't point them out. Hey, we have those that are watching online in their other locations as well. So would you help me welcome the rest of our family? Yeah, good to have you with us. So uh, this next weekend is a, an incredible weekend for us. Uh, it's an incredible harvest time for us. That's why we program so many services at all of our different locations as we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have some incredible services planned. In fact, there are 27 services at all of our seven locations. And so, uh, yeah, so there's... That, that shows you, the, the reason why we do this is not, not because we, we like to, to, to work hard. We like to do this because it's such an incredible opportunity and we need all of those services uh, to make room for everyone. So uh, the reason why I'm telling you this, first of all, pray for us and the team, the worship team, and uh, it's an incredible service they put together. We're going to present Christ and, uh, you know, as my pastor in Baton Rouge used to say, we're going to put the cookies on the bottom shelf so everybody can have some, right? I, I just can't wait to present Christ uh, this next weekend and celebrate his birth. It's an incredible service. We got some sing-alongs, some special music. We got the word. It's going to be a great time. I just want to encourage you to invite your friends or family in town, some co-workers, and uh, let's make Jesus famous. Amen? And uh, so I look, look forward to celebrating that with you guys next weekend. Uh, all of our service times are really our normal service times, but there'll be candlelight services. And so then we're adding some on Christmas Eve as well. So um, anyway, we are in this series right now. We're actually concluding a series uh, that we did called Once Upon a Christmas. And here's the idea behind this. We've been looking at other people's uh, views of Christmas. And so maybe we could see it a little bit different than we see it. And, uh, and what, is the thing, what are the things that we can learn uh, from others? We looked at God's view of Christmas. What does he think about Christmas? And then last week, uh, we did Joseph. And this week, we're going to cl- conclude with Mary. So if you have your notes, you can pull those out. Uh, we're going to read the word, and uh, we're going to get right into it. All right, here it is in Luke chapter 1. It says, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and he said, greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. Would you put your notes and everything down and let's pray. God, I thank you today. As we study your word that you want to help us see some things and understand some things, God, give us a view of our life and what we can learn about Christmas from Mary's eyes. Help us to see some things in our own lives. Help us live by faith and to trust you. God, I pray that you would just brand our lives today. I I don't want us to leave here uh, the same. We want to leave here different than we came. We don't want to just go through some religious service that we, we went to church, check it off the box. No, God, we want you to speak to us. So uh, church, posture your heart for just a moment. Would you just lean into God for a second? God, I thank you that you're gonna do something incredible today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Uh, I want you to circle in your notes there. uh, The angel told Mary, do not be afraid. That word afraid is the Greek word phobia, which is where we get the word phobia. uh, uh, It's phobia, phobia is the Greek word. It's where we get the word, the English word phobia from. How many of you are scared of some things? Come on, let me, let me see your hands, right? My wife is terrified of mice. Come on, anybody want to confess? Come on. Like she like trips when she sees a mice and, uh, or a mouse. And when she sees a lot of them, she really trips. Okay. We, got, we were first married, living in Louisiana one time. Uh, somebody, our, our neighbor was, was doing some construction. He had a big wood pile in the back of his yard. And when he, he moved it, there was a whole nest of mice. Or whatever you, you call them, a colony or a something. I don't know. It was nasty. And they just went running everywhere and got in our house. Oh, yeah, it was awful. So Amy moved to the other side of the house until all the mice were gone. She's like, I'm out of here. I don't want to see anything to do with this. So we were in North Carolina one time on vacation in the summer. 
And we were in this like park, this big area, open fields. And they had this, this big barn, like a two-story barn. And we were going to brought all our picnic stuff that day. We were with another family from the church. And we laid the picnic stuff out in the second floor of the barn. And we were going to eat. And all the kids are there. And literally, our daughter, Emily, she's she not even a year old, you know. And, and we got everything all set up. And I'm talking with this guy. And we're just kind of walking around the barn. And all of a sudden, I'm hearing some ee, ee, ree, ree, ee. And I look up in the rafters of the barn, and there are rats everywhere. And I think we brought the food in here, and maybe they were like, oh, yeah, it's dinner time. And so I'm trying to figure out how to get out of there without Amy just tripping. You know what I mean? And so she sees us talking, and she goes, what? She could tell something was wrong. And, and I was like, Amy, don't freak out. She goes, what? And she looks up and sees the rats. And I'm telling you, she ran. She left her kids in there to die. She did not care. I'm out of here, man. I'm gone. Scared to death of mice and rats. I have a fear of roaches. Yeah, come on. How many of you? Just want, let's, let's confess if you got one of those, right? I don't know where it came from, but uh, when Amy and I, we first got married, so uh, it was our first night in our house. Uh, we went on our honeymoon, came home, and then we're moving to our new house, and I carried her across the threshold. Yeah, a man, you know, coming to the house. And anyway, so we get ready. We go to bed that night and turn off the light, and all of a sudden, I feel something on the... <laughs> yeah, you know exactly what's happening, right? I flip on the light. I'm serious. One of those big, you know, it looks like a, like a palmetto bug. In, in Louisiana, they grow some big old roaches, you know, because of all the chemical plants and this. Yeah, anyway, they're like glowing in the dark and stuff. You know what I mean? Okay, and this roach is on the comforter. And I shake it like this and it flies across the other side of the room. I literally, I'm, 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 not, I'm not making this up. I stand up on the bed. I start running around. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. She looks at me like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> you know she's wanting to figure out how to get that marriage annulled or something like that. I married the biggest sissy there ever was, right? And then the roach comes flying at us, and I get under the covers, and I live like, oh, Amy, you gotta kill her. You gotta kill her. And I wouldn't come out of the covers until she could produce for me a dead roach. <laughs> Such my hero. Oh, I knew that's the way the Lord was going to do it, right? I have since overcome my fear of roaches. Yes, I'm a real man now. Okay. <laughs> See, Mary was given an announcement about her story. And uh, she is like a lot of us. When life doesn't go exactly like we want it, we have a tendency to run, right? Fear grips us and we're like, you know, I don't know if I really, I want to put up with that. And uh, Mary was full of fear. And so I think it's, it's in that moment. Here's the first thing I want you to get when it comes to God, uh, you know, filling out your story to, to writing your once upon a time story as well. Listen, maybe God, maybe he wants us to be uncomfortable. Nobody's going to say amen right there, right? Because if we were honest, come on, if we were honest, most of our prayers most of our conversations with God, are they not to make us comfortable? Think about it. Oh, God, I don't like this pain. Take away this pain. God, help me in this situation. God, get me a job. I don't like this job. God, get me another job. I want to make more money. God, get me a house. And then, then you pray, God, I want a bigger house. Or God, you know, get me a a car, and then, no, God, I want a new car. Give me a spouse. Come on, single people, pray, God, give me a spouse. I'm get a small group, and I'm going to find a good one. That's not why you go to small groups if you're single, by the way, okay? But I know what you're doing, so that's why you got quiet. Okay, I understand. <laughs> and then you get a spouse, and you're like, God, give me another spouse, because this one is scared of roaches and stuff, and I just can't, I don't want a sissy or whatever, you know, Right? Come on, are we honest, right? Most of our prayers, if you were to pull out your list of things you have conversations with God about, isn't, isn't it about making us comfortable? What if God wanted to leverage the temporal things in our lives to help us impact the eternal? 
Come on, y'all just get ready. Come on, all right, here it comes. Write that in your notes. What if God wanted to use your temporal things, your things of discomfort, what if he wanted to leverage those to actually put you at a place where you could make an eternal impact? Maybe God wants to use the very things you're asking him to remove to help us make a difference for our eternity. Maybe God has to get you to a place of being uncomfortable so that you can get to the place. And we say things like, oh, when we, when we get to the end of ourselves, don't we all say this? Okay, God, all right, then whatever you say. Come on, you ever, right? You, you wave the white flag and then we say, well, why did God wait to the last minute? Maybe you just waited to the last minute till you had no more options, right? And you finally had to say, okay, God, I'll do whatever, right? Come on. Y'all, I know why you're quiet, because that's exactly, I've been on your Facebook page. I know what's up. <laughs> okay, look in verse 30. Would you circle these two words, found favor? You have found favor. Could it be that God's favor is found in our seasons of discomfort? Hear what I'm saying, church. Maybe God wants you. I wouldn't say God causes your discomfort. That God puts bad things on you. I don't agree with that theology. But I can subscribe to the thought that it is in those moments that that might be the place that you really find God's favor. Now, what do those words mean? The word found means to see something. It means to learn something or it could mean to discover something. Which means this, that you will not discover God's favor in your life until you first have an opportunity to even see God's favor come upon you. And if everything's going right all the time, then, you, you know, you're never going to see God's favor. You'll take it for granted. If everything's going good all the time, you don't have to pray. You don't have to seek God. You, you're not in a place of discomfort. You ever noticed you pray harder? You seek God more. You're going after the things of God a whole lot more when things are not going well. Come on, y'all say amen if that's you, right? So that's where we discover God's favor. I think it's because that's when we really are looking for it. And it's not till we get to those moments of discomfort. Now, the other word I wanted you to circle is the word favor. That word favor is the Greek word charis, which most times when you read it in the New Testament, by the way, the English translation, the word they'll use is grace. Everybody say grace. grace. Come on, amazing grace. How sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. Most people don't know what's a wretch. You know what I mean? But you a wretch. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, that's you. That's what that is, right? <laughs> See, God's grace, God's charis, God's favor couldn't get you until you first realize amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch. I, I had to be in a problem before I could turn to God. Oh, come on, think about it. Just think about it. You didn't start coming to church and going after God because everything was good. You weren't like, man, everything is just so peachy. Let's go to church. <laughs> right? There was a problem in your life. There was, a, there was a pain point in your life. There was something that was not working out like you were striving and believing for. And all of a sudden you went like, well, we has got to go to church now. We, there's nowhere else for us to turn but to God. Okay, here's what I'm saying. Maybe God wants us to be uncomfortable because it is in those moments that you can find, you can discover, you actually start looking for God's grace, God's favor in your life. So, I would tell you, if you're in one of those moments right now, maybe there's some fear that has gripped your life, whatever it is. Maybe a report, maybe a relationship, maybe a financial issue, maybe just some decisions in life is around your college or you're going to be graduating, you're wondering about your career, you're, you're worried about the future, you have a relationship that's not going right and you're like, oh my gosh, and you, you know how it is when you feel like you're in no man's land? You, you're so insecure. Well, that's a good thing because it's when you're uncomfortable that I think you can experience God's favor. Let's go back to Luke. It says in verses 31, it says, uh, this is the angel still speaking to Mary. He says, you will conceive and you're going to give birth to a son. And you're going to name him Jesus. And he's going to be very great. And he'll be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. And he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. 
okay, I, I want to really dig into something in this, these couple of verses here. First, write this in your notes. Write these words, receive, you'll see your blanks there, receive and believe. You see, Mary had to get to the place where she r- received something and then she had this heart and this attitude of believing. Now, I, I really want you to grab this first, circle the words in verse 32 that, that he will be great. Okay, I, I, really, I really do believe this, is that, uh, that, that we can't birth great things in our life if we aren't willing to go through some difficult times. See, God was saying, look, Mary, I know you're afraid. I know it's difficult. I know it's uncomfortable. There's so much of your future that is unknown with the words that I'm telling you. However, I'm going to birth something in you that's going to be extremely great. And we all want God to do great things in our life. I mentioned it last week, right? All of us, we, we want a life that makes a difference. And so I, I believe that those things are birthed in your moments of most difficulty, and you never really experience that. You never get those words. Those things are never put inside you until you're in those difficult moments. And uh, there, there's some interesting words here. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for some people in, in the middle of the message here in just a moment. Uh, I want you to circle in verse 31. Circle the word conceive. That word means to receive something. So he says to her, you're going to conceive. You're going you're to receive something into your life. And then the very next part of the verse, he says, and you're going to circle the words give birth. It means something is actually going to grow. See, Mary had to put herself in a place, church, where she could receive what God wanted to accomplish in her life. And then she had to believe the promise until it became a reality. So God wants to, I believe, spiritually, he wants to birth some things in your life. And you are going to have to receive them, but there is going to have to be an attitude, an environment of faith for you to believe so that those things actually can be birthed in your life. And I'm speaking spiritually. Now, um, I believe just like we, in the natural, a, a lot of times, l- ladies, that when they get pregnant, right, and then they, they have a miscarriage. They, d- they don't carry the, the child to full term. I, uh, I know that's painful. In fact, you know, Amy and I ha- had that uh, happen as well. And, and I think that, you know, there's typically it's something wrong. The body's rejecting. There's something that's, that's not right inside the system, and that's why the miscarriage happens. Okay, I submit to you that there are things that we conceive. In other words, God says something many times in our lives, however that is. Could be in a church service, listening to a podcast, reading a book, reading your Bible, having a time with God, and he speaks something to you and you conceive something, you receive something in your life, but it never comes to fruition. There's a miscarriage spiritually. And I wanna talk about that for a moment. But I really believe with all my heart that, that you don't have to. You don't have to be a barren person spiritually. And the things that God speaks to you that he wants to birth in your life. In fact, I believe there are some women here in the natural. You want to have a child. Maybe you have a lot of miscarriages or maybe you just can't conceive and God put it on my heart to pray for you today. Amy and I had issues like that when we were early uh, married. And then God gave us a word. It's in Exodus chapter 23, verses 25 through 26. It says, worship the Lord your God and his blessings will be on your food and your water. And I'll take away sickness from among you and no one in your land will miscarry or be barren. We read that verse. It was conceived in us spiritually that that was for us. And we wrote it everywhere, right? We did, we was on the the, the mirrors, on the dashboards of the car, on the refrigerator, you know, it was all over the place and, and it works. We have four kids. So I'm nervous about reading the verse tonight. I mean, God knows what's gonna happen. We'll have a bigger problem, though, if she is pregnant, and that's a whole nother sermon, but (laughs) that's a counseling session. Anyway, (laughs) okay, so, but, but God gave us a word, and it was, we received it, and we believed it, and it became a reality. Okay, and so for some of you here today, uh, would you, everybody, all of our locations, wherever you are watching online, here, would you close your eyes? And I want, I want to pray for some, some people in here. Perhaps you're barren in, in the natural and you want to have a child and you, you can't. Uh, maybe it's a miscarriage issue. I, I want to pray for you. Father, right now in Jesus' name, I just pray for the reproductive systems, God, to 
miraculous work to be done. Where there are ladies, women that are in our church who cannot conceive and give birth. I pray, God, for a miracle. Whatever it is, open up things, heal things, do creative miracles, God. Whatever it takes. What was missing, God, let it be no more lack in Jesus' name. And I thank you, the God, that they will flourish in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give God some praise for what he's doing? Yeah. So when uh, Amy and I first started the church, uh, within uh, a few months of that, it was about six months, we found out that she was pregnant again. And, uh, you know, well, look, we, we first started the church. We put all the chips on the table, cashed in all savings accounts, any 401ks. I mean, we put it all on the table and we're living on credit cards for the first couple years of the church, just trying to make it work. So being pregnant at that moment is bad timing. How many of y'all? All right. Okay. And so we literally, for three months, we were like crying and depressed. Because like, God, we don't have insurance. We don't have enough money. So we went to, went to the health centers and, and got on the, some uh, wick so we could buy some more groceries. I mean, it was, it, was, it was bad. And God, do you know what God did to us? He like, you ever, you ever been taken to the woodshed with God before? Like, well, what's the matter with you? <laughs> you know, here we are complaining because God has given us another blessing. And there are some people that are begging God for a child and can't have one. I mean, come on, Randy, get your, get your life straight. I mean, really, all right? And, and we did. And uh, God blessed us with our only daughter. And I'm so glad that God uh, chose to be faithful in that. I, I love my daughter. I don't have a sister. And so uh, I didn't have a daughter up to that time. And I wouldn't change it for one second. Of course, all the boys go, she's the favorite. And well, she is. So, <laughs> so let it be known. Yeah. So, um, to get to the spiritual point of this, I think that there are things that we have to do in us spiritually. We can receive, but, but will you believe so that what God has put in you can, can actually be birthed spiritually? And uh, I think it's up to you. I think it's up to me. It's up to us to create this environment like... You know, to have a, a womb in such a way spiritually that can contain that and give birth to it. How did Mary do it? The scripture tells us how. Look, it says Mary treasured up all these things and she pondered them in her heart. Circle three words, treasured, pondered, heart. This is how she did it. Treasured means to make something sacred, to make something special. Like, oh man, this is so important. So the words that she got from God of this promise of the son, she like, I'm holding on. This is mine. It's treasured. No one's going to take this away from me. And then pondered, it means she kept reminding herself of it. That's what pondering, that's what that word in the Greek means. It's like, I'm, I'm going to keep thinking about it. I'm going to keep reminding myself. And when the devil lies to me and tells me it's not going to happen, I'm going to go, oh, yes, it is. And, and that's the, what we have to do. That's the environment spiritually for you to give birth to what God is putting in your heart. And, and the most important thing is it says she did this in her heart. That's the, the Greek word is suke. It's where we get, uh, you know, psychology and all of that from. But it, what it means is the very, the very core of who you are. That means like in, in here, you got to go, listen, it doesn't matter what my mind thinks. It doesn't matter what my heart is feeling. It matters in here what I believe. And when I believe what God has said he's going to do in my life, I'm going to ponder those things. I'm going to treasure those things. Oh, it's going to give birth in his timing. In Jesus' name. And, and so, I'm just going to, real quick, I'm going to give you some thoughts on something. You can probably read it later, or you maybe you've heard about it. It's in Luke chapter 8. Jesus is teaching on the parable of the, the seed. And you got to remember, too, or you need to know if, if you don't know this, but Jesus taught in parables, but they always have a spiritual meaning to them, right? Uh, it, and so, Jesus was teaching on the parable of the seed, and he was talking about how a farmer goes and he sows seed on the ground, and and there's four different kinds of ground that the seed falls on. And the seed always represents the word of God. Meaning, we're going to receive God's word. And is it going to produce a harvest in our life, right? And there's four kinds of soil. Would you, would you write these down? Uh, I, uh, I'm going to tell them to you. The first one is the, the ground was hard. Some of you, you can't birth what God wants to do in your life. Because your ground, your, your heart, your suke, 
is hard, which means there's unforgiveness there. There's resentment there. There's, there's hurt. Look, we all experience hurt. Okay, but it's what you do with that that makes you hard, bitter, resentful, and calloused. And if you don't process that and learn how to walk in forgiveness, then then it'll keep God's word. You might receive it, but you'll never give birth to it because your soil, your heart, your suke is not right. Well, I hope you guys are getting this. Okay, the second one is the shallow ground. And the shallow ground represents people that I would call that are, uh, you know, real surfacey kind of people, right? They're meistic. They're, they're Captain You Planet, okay? Those are the ones I, remember I said earlier that most of our prayers are all like, God, make me comfortable. Everything is all about, well, it's always about them. It, they're all, it's always about them, how they're feeling and they're going through difficult times and I'm not minimizing difficult times. But sometimes you gotta get your eyes off yourself. Otherwise, you're a real shallow person and you'll never give birth to what God has in your life. Me, me, me all the time. Okay, so um, the next one is busy. And, or is, is it the, the scripture called it, as the thorns grow up and then it, it chokes it out. I would call this people that are just too busy. Just consumed with life, you know. Why is it a badge in our culture? How you doing? Oh, just busy. Oh, yeah, man, me too. Busy, 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 right? Like, that's good. Like, busy is good. Busy will choke out God's blessing in your life. Because you're so busy doing, you don't have time for God to really nurture something in your heart. I, I love our 21 days of prayer and fasting that we have coming up in January. I'm asking you as a church, as, if this is your church and I'm your pastor, please, whatever you do, participate in some way. Please, give up something. Go, I'm, I'm giving up caffeine, I'm giving up TV, I'm giving up social media or breakfast or lunch or coffee or whatever it is. Please give up something and say, God, you're more important than even that and schedule some time in your life that day. During these 21 days, we have morning prayer at all of our campuses. Show up and let's pray and let's see God. Yeah, get rid of the busyness, church. And can we just spend some time with God? Lord knows what might be conceived and birthed in our lives in a season where we're not so busy. That's why some people are so spiritually barren. They're hard, they're shallow, and they're just busy. But then there's the fourth soil, and that is they called it good, the good soil. And the scripture describes it in Luke 8, 15. But the seed on good soil stands for those with noble and good heart who hear God's word. Look, they retain it. In other words, they, they receive it and they retain it. And by persevering, they produce a, a crop. In other words, they're not just receiving something, they're believing something, holding on to it. And uh, do me one favor, because I'm going I'm to circle back to this later. It'll make sense. In that verse, would you circle the words God's word? The God's word, those two words is the Greek word logos. Okay, L-O-G-O-S, write that in your notes. Okay, we're going to circle back to that later. I want you to understand it's talking about God's written word. We'll, we'll dive into that a little bit later. Okay, so God may want us to be uncomfortable. We have to receive and we have to believe. You mean your heart has to be in the right place. And remember what qualifies you for God to do great things in your life. Back to our story in Luke. So Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen since I'm only a virgin? The angel replied, the Holy Spirit's gonna come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. The baby to be born will be holy and he'll be called the Son of God for nothing is impossible with God. Somebody say amen. amen. Okay, Mary starts out by saying, well, look, I'm just a, you know, I'm only a virgin. She starts immediately discrediting herself on why God couldn't use her. I mean, she's very young maybe 13, 14, 15 years old. I'm in a small town, I'm from a poor family and I'm, I'm not very well known, it's just totally discrediting herself. Why do we always lead with that when we feel like God wants us to do something great? We wanna look at all the problem areas in our lives, right? Well, all the reasons why God couldn't. Well, I, you know, I'm still working this out. I still struggle, struggle with pornography. I still get angry sometimes. I still drink sometimes. And so God, God can't use me. That's exactly the kind of person that God wants to use. That's exactly the kind of person. We all do that. Mary did it. But then God's answer to this is in verse 35. It's the word the Holy Spirit will overshadow. Circle that word overshadow. It means to exert creative energy. So you may not be able to, but God can. 
That's, that, that word overshadow that we see there actually can be traced all the way back into the Old Testament, all the way into the book of Genesis, where when God created, he exerted creative energy over the earth and, and he made it to be. It means he took something that was nothing and made it into something what we all live and know now. And it says the Holy Spirit, if you read in Genesis, was hovering over the face of the earth, right? And God created it by exerting creative energy through the Holy Spirit. So get your eyes off yourself. Look, quit telling your, your, your God about your inabilities and about your weaknesses and about your, your problems and start telling your problems, your inabilities and your weaknesses and your insufficiencies about your God. You're facing the wrong direction, church. And, and you discredit yourself in that. And if you will, you will get this right in your life and you'll, you'll understand, God, that what qualifies me and, and what really is going to make me live in all that you have for me, it's not about me. I am disqualified already. And it's okay. Accept it. Do you still have sin in your life? Of course you do. Are you going to mess up again? I know you are. But the Holy Spirit... Let him overshadow you. You're overshadowing the Holy Spirit. That's what the problem is. We quenching the Spirit because we're making it about ourselves. Come on, church. And it is in that moment, nothing is impossible with God. Okay, I got to get to my last point because uh, I got some things I, I, really, I really want to come alive to you. So the last thought here is to keep your perspective. So realize that God may want you to be uncomfortable you got to receive and believe some things, right? And, and, and get your focus off your own problems. Realize this is about God. And it's your perspective. Okay, check this out. This is, this is powerful. Let's go back to our story in Luke. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. Be it to me as you have said. And then jump down. She, she writes this song. And, and the song says, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit Rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. Okay, there's, there's a few words I, I want to talk to you. Would you circle these words in your notes? I want you to circle in verse 38 there the word said. As you have said. All right, then I want you to circle the word soul. That's the suke again. The inner part of me, I'm going to choose, and the word glorifies means to make you large. Hey, okay, get this, church, please. Um, I want us to get our lives off of ourselves and to realize our, our purpose while we're on this earth is to make God bigger. And, and that means that, you know, you, you need to be a humble servant. It's, in other words, let's die to ourselves. Paul says in Galatians um, chapter 2, he says that, that I no longer live, but I live that's Christ that lives in me. And so I've been crucified with Christ, as he calls it. All I'm saying is if that if you and I are going to do great things for God in our life, and he's going to do great things in us, then it, it might be better if you just die to yourself and say, God, I just want to live for you. And don't come to God so he can make your life great. Just come to God and die to self and see what great things he has for you. That's a whole new perspective right there. Don't come to God so that he can make your life great. Come to God and surrender your life to him and just see what greatness he brings you to. Church, that, that's a new way of, of looking at things. Uh, in other words, in other words, quit living for everybody else and live for an audience of one. How about we just do that? Like my soul, God, I just want to glorify you. It doesn't matter what everybody else says. And then, and then Mary says something, you know, she says, may everything that you have said, Okay, a lot of translations, uh, may your word come true. Okay, here we are looking at another Greek word that is parallel to what I had you circle earlier about God's word. Remember I had you circle the word and it was the word logos. This word said 
which is oftentimes in English, we'll see it in the New Testament as the word rhema. It's not the most common word, R-H-E-M-A. It's not the most common Greek word for the word word in the New Testament. Logos is, okay? What's the difference in these two? Okay, logos is God's written word. It's the Bible, okay? It's, it's what God, that we study it all the time around here. This church is a Logos church. We believe God's word and I'm never gonna change it and I'm gonna teach it and I'm gonna live by it and our theology and everything else is based on the Logos and God's word. And I'm not gonna change it to fit me or anybody else. We're gonna believe God's word. Okay, however, there are times when God's written word can become rhema word for us. What does that word rhema mean? It means spoken personal word. Okay, God's written word is very generic. In other words, his promises are in there and all of us can read them and understand them. You gotta have the right heart and the right soil so that God's word can be put into your life. But here's what you have to have in order for God's promises to come alive and be birthed in your life. It has to go from logos, from a generic word, to rhema, a very personal spoken word just for you. And you need to know that God has that for you. You need to know that God wants to give you a spoken personal word, that he has a purpose and a plan and a vision for your life. And if you will get yourself in a place, if you will posture yourself in such a way to spend time with God and let your heart be leaning into him, even in your most uncomfortable moments and present yourself and posture yourself in such a way where you can receive from him, then I believe God will drop rhema words in your life. God's word, I read to you earlier, Exodus chapter 23, is a logos word. But Amy and I made it a rhema word. That is for me. We are not going to miscarry or be barren. And we're going to live a full lifespan. And that word became rhema to us. And we got all the kids we need. All right? Okay? You, You understand what I'm saying? God's word has done this many times in my life. I I was reminded of a situation when I was very young. The devil's tried to take my life so many times and he's a fool and he's a liar and he's not gonna have it in Jesus' name. But I was young and I was very, very sick. And I remember being in my house, running extremely high fever. I don't even remember what the situations were, but I was reminded of that moment. And I remember sitting there and I was having hallucinations and the fever was so high and I was so sick and I saw demons and I saw in the spiritual realm of things and I was terrified. I was scared to death and my mom had just started singing some worship songs. Man, I don't even remember what they were, but good Lord, they were good. She was singing like an angel, you know, and she started quoting scripture and I started singing worship songs with her and I started quoting the word with her and the logos word became rhema word, and it left. It left in Jesus' name. I was with one of my kids the other day. We're driving through town the other day, and we take a shortcut because there's all kinds of traffic around here now. Like, what in the world is going on with our community, right? Anyway, that's a whole nother sermon too. I love it. I love traffic because it's like more people to reach for Jesus. It's awesome. Yeah. I know you don't like it, but I'm, yeah, move here. Come on, yeah. Anyway, see, I'm looking at it from a different lens. Anyway, that's a whole nother sermon too. But all right, so we have to cut around off of Lakewood Ranch Boulevard and we go right through uh, River Run or uh, where Braden River Middle School and Elementary School is. And I'm with one of my kids and we're passing right by there. And I go, you see those schools right there, son? This is the place. I was right here when God spoke to me 17 years ago about starting Bayside Community Church. School was getting out. I saw families and everybody hanging out. And, you know, parents are in their golf carts and, you know, in the school line and all of that going on. I saw all those people and God put it in my heart, a rhema word. Because God's church is, is in the word of God, the logos. But it became rhema that I'm to build his church, Bayside Community Church. And it became rhema to me right there when I saw those families. See all these people right here, Randy? I want you to come here and reach them and help them know me. It was a rhema word. That's what birthed this church. Okay, I don't know what it is in your life right now that you need. Maybe you are terrified of some situations right now. And thank God for Mary, because she gave us an incredible plan how you can go from being full of fear 
to seeing God use you in an incredible way. We're still talking about it thousands of years later. That's the legacy I want to live. That's the legacy that you can live. Let's die to ourselves and live for him and birth great things in our lives. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? God, I thank you for your word. I thank you so much, God, that you have assembled us here for a reason. And God, when you speak, we have an opportunity to receive. God, now help us to believe. Help us to to declutter our lives so that by faith, God, your word can can grow inside us. Keep our hearts right. We want to be humble, God. I don't, who cares about us? We die to ourselves. We are crucified with Christ so that you can live in us. God, in other words, do whatever you want to do, God. Our prayers will not be for comfort. Our prayers will be to glorify you. And God, let your word in those moments, it can't help but become rhema. Birth it now. Do incredible things. Give visions and ideas and business concept. God, you're blessing people's businesses and families. Children are being birthed, God. All kinds of things are happening in the spirit realm right now because we just so happen to be posturing ourselves in such a way that you could do great things through us too. In Jesus' name. And with your eyes still closed and heads bowed, I'll ask our campus host to join me on the platform as well. No one looking around, no one moving, just a couple of more minutes here. Here's what I want to pray. Because all this has to be started in right relationship with God. If that's you and you don't know God and you want to say, I, I, want, I want that. I want to die to myself so that I can live in Christ. And that's not just an earthly life. God doesn't just want to work in your life now, but this is like eternity with Him. You've never done it. Or maybe you have and you've, you've drifted. It's time to recenter yourself spiritually. I want to pray with you. If that's you, whatever location you're at, come on, lift your hand up. Is a sign of saying, Pastor, I want to be included in that prayer. Lift your hand up high right now, wherever you are. Great, that's awesome. Would you put your hands back down? I'm going to ask all of us now, would you, would you pray this with me? Would you say, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for leading me. Leading me to the cross. A place where there's life forgiveness, freedom, Holy Spirit. I can't do it on my own. Give me the strength and the power to live in freedom and to live in all that God has for me. So right now, Jesus, I'm out of the driver's seat. It's yours. I surrender everything I have to you. You are my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.